Well, welcome everybody. My name is Avodia Wally, President of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Contra Costa County, and I also chair the Alameda County Hispanic Chamber. We're extremely honored here to have Stephen Wad of the State Bar of California. He's Chief Trial Counsel from the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel. We we're also uh, joined here by Paul Graves, who is the Deputy District Attorney of Contra Costa County, and we're going to have an informal discussion here on something that's prevalent throughout the legal profession right now and out in the community, which is immigration fraud. And this has been a big concern of Stephen Watt, and he's uh, basically been out there trying to inform people and uh, try to try, trying to find solutions for resolving this uh, very uh, serious matter. So, uh, Stephen and, and Paul, can you uh, please give us an intro of yourselves and give, give us an overview of who you are, what you do, and uh, what you're looking to do in this specific area? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, as as Vo mentioned, uh, my name is Steve Mowad. I am the Chief Trial Counsel for the State Bar of California, and that means that I'm the Chief Prosecutor of Attorney Misconduct for the State of California. We are the agency that regulates attorney misconduct. Um, and I'm here because I want to get the word out and warn the public in general and immigrant communities in particular to watch out for and report potential legal fraud. The risk of legal fraud is obviously increased by fear of immigration raids, uh, uncertainty for DACA recipients, and just general ongoing concerns faced by our immigrant communities. I have uh, a special connection to Contra Costa County. I, my family is from there, and I was a deputy district attorney in the office of the district attorney along with Paul Graves for approximately 20 years. So I'll throw it over to him to introduce himself. All right. Thanks, Steve. My name is Paul Graves. I'm a senior deputy district attorney here in Contra Costa County, and I currently supervise the Family Violence Unit, which is sexual assault, domestic violence, and elder abuse. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of our Victims and witnesses that I deal with in my unit every day are uh, undocumented and from uh, immigrant communities. And so this hits very close to home to me uh, and a county level because we have a very vested interest in having every member of our community feel that they, should, they can come forward, talk to law enforcement, and come to our office and we will serve them. And the quieting effect has a ripple effect through all crimes. And when we do have a victim come forward, and they're trying to apply for a U visa or trying to get citizenship, um, and they run into one of these consultants or attorneys who are committing fraud, um, it looks bad on all of us, and it really cannot be tolerated in our society. We have too much human trafficking, too much sexual abuse, too much physical abuse, and we really want everyone in our community to feel free to come forward and know they can come to our office and get assistance. And Steve, I'll kick it back to you. Okay. So uh, the state bar has issued a fraud alert, a legal fraud alert, uh, to watch out for attorneys, notarios, or other unlicensed legal providers uh, by taking a couple of specific steps. First, when you go to look for legal help and you go to an attorney's office, you should uh, ask for their state bar number and go and look them up on our website to check the status of their license. Um, I would note that if you're looking for help with an immigration matter, the attorney is not required to have a California law license. And in essence, attorneys who are properly licensed and in good sta standing in another state can come to California and practice in the immigration courts in California, even if they're not licensed by the State Bar of California. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so you should go and, and check the California State Bar to see if they're licensed there, or you can ask them where they are licensed and check their license status in that state. You can look on their State Bar profile to see if they have a history of discipline as well, because we provide that information to uh, consumers, and that may be relevant to the determination of whether you want to hire this person or not. You should also be wary of anyone that refers to themselves as a notario. The use of this title is not authorized in California. I have a screenshot of our website here. This is actually the main website when you log into the State Bar of California's website. And uh, you can see in the box that I've highlighted here is the look up the lawyer. Um, 
and it has you can search them by either by name or by state bar number and it will pop up with their attorney profile a couple of other caveats is that while it's not legally required uh, unless the cost for services is going to be more than $1,000, uh, it's always a good idea to get a contract for legal services in writing. And also, you should try and get written receipts for any payments that, that you make, if you're, particularly if you're paying somebody in cash. Uh, frankly, I would be wary of anyone that doesn't want to provide those items to you in writing. I also want to point out and make sure that everyone is aware that California law requires that an agreement for legal services uh, f with somebody who is licensed to practice law in California is re required to provide that contract uh, to the, the recipient of the contract in whatever language it was negotiated in. So if the, that contract was negotiated orally in Spanish or one of several other languages, um, whenever that is reduced to writing, that that person must deliver to the other person a complete translation of the contract into that language. That means you cannot negotiate a contract in Spanish and then be forced to sign the contract in English. Uh, I would also be wary if somebody requires cash payments. Uh, and like I said, you should always keep a paper trail. Uh, if you don't have a bank account, use a cashier's check. Try to avoid using cash. Uh, if you have already made a payment to an attorney, you are entitled to ask for an accounting of your bills. And what that means is you can ask them uh, how they spent their time on your case and what the cost for each of those items are. California law prohibits lawyers or others acting on behalf of a lawyer from promising a particular outcome from legal representation from lying about their ability to represent you in immigration court or act as your lawyer, or from seeking clients by mail unless the letter and envelope are clearly labeled as an advertisement. You can, uh, uh, with a couple of words of caution about hiring an immigration consultant. Immigration consultants are a thing. They are uh, exist in statute, and it is possible to go out and hire an immigration consultant, but you need to be clear and understand what an immigration consultant can and cannot do. Uh, so when, when you submit, uh, when you go to an immigration consultant, it, they can fill out the paperwork and, and can translate and submit forms, but an immigration consultant cannot give you legal advice. This means that they cannot tell you which forms to fill out or what information you should or should not put on the forms. They also cannot represent people in immigration court. So, Steve, I guess Wait. this is where I jump in at the local level um, yes. for these consultants. And, you know, what I would say is uh, the consultants to me, this is one of the most dangerous areas. I understand people are using them, like Steve said. But it's very, very dangerous because unless they are associated with a established nonprofit organization, if you're just using somebody out there who says that they are a consultant and they hold themselves out to that, there's a high risk that uh, it could be criminal activity. Um, I put down here the Business and Professions Code section. It starts at 2240. And we don't have enough time in the day to go through all the requirements for the immigration consultants and all the ways they can violate the law. But... Uh, it's a situation where you believe that they are doing things or they may misrepresent uh, their capacity as a consultant and you start paying them money. And next thing you know, you're not getting the services that you think you are getting. Uh, oftentimes what they'll do, Steve, I'm sure you'd agree is they, they sort of hold themselves out to be a lawyer, even though they're not. Um, and if you are not aware of exactly what the limitations of a consultant are, it's really easy to, um, be taken uh, in a fraud. A couple important things is that the consultant must give client all copies of documents submitted on their behalf. So you should always make sure you get all documents in writing and everything that is submitted or they say they're doing for you, sh they should be given back to you. Uh, most importantly is, you know, the consultant, if they start misrepresenting to you or they start talking to you about all the great things that they can do for you at the United States Citizen citizenship and immigration service or any government agency, you know, even if they're saying, Hey, I know somebody, I can fast track this. I'd be very, very wary of that. Um, those misleading statements are criminally actionable. 
Uh, they are a, at least a misdemeanor. Uh, and so it's something that if the state bar is aware of, they would actually forward this down to the local level for us uh, to prosecute or to look into. Another thing you should be aware of because it's this provision here under 2243 that a consultant is not allowed to keep your original documents. And to me, this is really important because an easy way to commit fraud on somebody is you take all their original documents, whatever it may be, and then you hold them. Well, that person then is beholden to you. Uh, you can hold those uh, from them and not return them to them until you get payment, until they uh, continue to get more payments from you. And it is sort of a, an element of duress or fraud that what are you going to do when they're holding on to your original documents so really be aware that they cannot keep those documents. If you turn them over there, I would not leave a consultant until I got my original documents back. And if you don't, then I would make sure that I reported that, uh, at least to the authorities or to the state bar. Another uh, fraud that often occurs with these consultants is you will go talk to the consultant. Uh, they will take your money uh, and they will start the process for you and assist you, but then they're gonna wanna refer you to an attorney and they're going to want to charge you a fee for returning, uh, for referring you to an attorney. This they cannot do. Now, if you dig through the statutes, they are not allowed to do that. So again, if they keep asking for more and more money for services that seem to you to be out of, out of line with what a consultant should be doing, I'd be highly suspicious of that and, and talk to the authorities. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, when this stuff occurs, too often people don't want to come forward. And they don't want to highlight the fact that maybe they are consulting with an immigration consultant. And, and these individuals prey on that. And they will say things like, oh, what are you going to do? Call the authorities. If you do, you're going to get deported. And that's just not the case. I can tell you here in Contra Costa County, uh, if you come to us, uh, we will make sure we take care of these people who are perpetrating the fraud. And, and it will not uh, be a situation where you need to be worried about get deport, getting deported by our office. Um, this kind of fraud cannot be tolerated. So, Steve, I'll kick it back to you unless uh, you have some questions of me on some of these criminal violations. I don't have any questions of you, and I think other people are muted, at least at this point. Uh, so unless Vo uh, wants me to unmute everyone and ask questions at this point, I think we'll just carry on. But I do want to point out that uh, Paul brings up an excellent point. Uh, about the cooperation and, and between our office and local law enforcement. The state bar regulates attorneys, people who are, are licensed by the state bar of California. And so in some of these circumstances with the unauthorized practice of law or immigration consultants, these are not people who are authorized to, to practice law who have a license. So we have very limited jurisdiction there. We cannot administratively prosecute them like we do with licensed attorneys. So instead, what we do is conduct an investigation and make referrals to local law enforcement like the Contra Costa DA's office or the Alameda County DA's office, uh, a number of different city attorney's offices who prosecute misdemeanor uh, level crimes, as well as local police agencies and other regulatory agencies. And then we continue to in conduct our own investigation in parallel with them and share information in order to assure that people who prey on these vulnerable communities are being prosecuted. And Steve, if I could just, uh, sorry to jump on, if I could just add one more thing about the difference sort of between what your organization does and what we can do at a local level. Um, when we're talking about consultants or any kind of immigration fraud on vulnerable communities, oftentimes the people paying, that are paying for these services are using, you know, their life savings. Uh, this is, they've scraped it together and they've paid money. And, you know, when a criminal prosecution occurs, we can actually get restitution from these violators and get money back that was paid to them uh, without the victim having to necessarily hire a civil lawyer to do that. So it is one advantage of coming forward to law enforcement is we can take care of this. And if we do prosecute, part of the end result of the punishment would be to make the person whole that was uh, defrauded by this individual. So uh, that is one advantage. And I would like to point that out because it is, Oftentimes, like I said, people's life savings that they're putting forward to get this stuff done and they deserve to get that money back. I absolutely agree. And, and we have the same ability uh, or at least a, a, more, a somewhat more limited but similar ability uh, with licensed attorney. So when we prosecute them, we have the ability to get 
uh, unearned fees and any uh, misappropriated funds back to victims. But the, cl the criminal prosecution arena has much greater authority over uh, not only a greater extent of restitution, but also over people that we don't have jurisdiction over, the uh, unauthorized practice of law, the immigration consultants. So a couple of other points about immigration attorneys is that to appear in immigration courts, attorneys or accredited representatives have to be registered with the Executive Office of Immigration Review or EOIR. <coughs> uh, as I mentioned before, attorneys who are properly licensed and in good standing in some other state can practice immigration uh, law in courts in California, in immigration courts in California, even when they are not licensed by the State Bar of California. But if someone files a complaint with my office about an immigration attorney that isn't licensed in California, for example, they have a license in Kansas or New Mexico or wherever, wherever else, uh, my office will take those complaints and forward them to the discipline, disciplinary authority in the correct state. To, so we will make sure that that complaint gets to the office with jurisdiction over that attorney. So how do you avail yourselves of, of resources uh, that the State Bar has? And we have a number of resources at this website, www.calbar.ca.gov. At the website, we have the complaint form to report the unauthorized practice of law in English, Spanish, and many other languages. We have the complaint form for, to report attorney misconduct in those same languages. We also have a list of legal aid organizations in California and also a list specifically of immigration legal resources and legal aid organizations. And those lists are in English, Spanish, and many other languages. Uh, we also have resources on, uh, for people dealing with uh, immigration issues uh, and other information on how people can avoid fraud. So filing a complaint, if someone uh, promises immigration legal services and you suspect them of misconduct, you should file a complaint with, with our office and we will refer it out to local law enforcement. You can also go directly to law enforcement or you can go, go to both. Um, and you do not need to be, as, as Paul mentioned, a U.S. citizen to file a complaint, to go to local law enforcement, or to come to the state bar. Uh, the state bar will not ask you about your immigration status. It's irrelevant to our determination of whether that attorney or uh, is committing some form of misconduct or the person it was or was not authorized to practice law. It's irrelevant to that determination. So a couple of common reasons why people might file a complaint against their attorney. And that is that your lawyer doesn't respond to your repeated attempts at contact or refuses to return phone calls or emails. Uh, a settlement check was sent to your attorney, but your lawyer never tells you about it or gives you any of that money. Uh, or your lawyer settles your case without your permission and never informs you. Uh, an attorney has an obligation to keep their client informed of important developments. And if that's the case, then, then people need to be able to uh, report that. So Steve, uh, just to jump in before we go to the criminal violations, um, but what you just listed there, there's, are you saying there's a variety of different ways in which the people can be taken advantage of and immigrant communities can be taken advantage of? It's not just in the application for uh, citizenship. It's not just the application for you visas, but it could also be if they have a, a valid lawsuit and the lawyer is just pocketing the money and not notifying them. And then if they try to complain to the lawyer saying, hey, what are you going to do about it? Is that Abs sort of what we're talking about? Absolutely. It, it happens in all different areas. It, and it, it may be uh, that it happens in the immigration arena, for example, filing uh, for U visas or, or some other type of visa uh, or citizen change in status. Uh, but it, it absolutely could happen uh, in the run-of-the-mill, you know, slip and fall or car accident case. Uh, the attorney may try to take advantage of their immigrant status uh, and, you know, in, under the hopes that they won't report that to the state bar or local law enforcement because they'll be concerned that they would be deported or, or somehow uh, get in trouble for their uh, immigration status. And what we're trying to convey, and I know what you're trying to convey, is that that's absolutely not the case, uh, that we are here 
to uh, go after uh, the attorneys who commit the misconduct and the people who uh, practice law without being authorized to do so and take advantage of people. And we can do that administratively. And, and Paul and, and his team and others like him can uh, take advantage of the criminal violations. Sure. And that, and that thanks, Stephen. That, that sort of uh, segues into the common criminal violations in these situations. Um, we're talking about Immigration matters. Uh, there's a penal code section 653.55. It is a misdemeanor for a person for compensation to knowingly make a false or misleading statement of material fact in an immigration matter. And this actually can happen, especially with uh, consultants or with attorneys where they have promised services and maybe they make a, a misleading statement and that's something that we can prosecute. Uh, but as Steve was talking, one of the probably most prevalent statutes that we can prosecute under is theft uh, by fraud or whatever it may be. It depends on whether or not the amount is under $950, but if you are paying for services and that individual is not performing the services, then we can prosecute them for theft. If there is a settlement and they're pocketing the check, I mean, that is theft. Uh, and it depends on the amount, whether we prosecute as a misdemeanor or felony. And to be honest with you, as Steve and I keep reiterating, it does not matter to my office or to Steve's office, whether or not you are a citizen or not. This is the type of behavior that cannot be tolerated. Uh, lawyers do not want other lawyers out there doing this, and we cannot have it in our community. We also have, uh, there is a criminal violation for practicing law without a license, and it depends on sort of the manner in which they're practicing without a license. And, and Steve can probably add on these if I miss any, but there, there may be your immigration consultant who is acting like a lawyer without a license. And that typically is a misdemeanor. But there's also lawyers who may be in trouble with the state bar. They may be on probation or they may be suspended and they technically are not allowed to be practicing law at that time. Uh, it's a risk that they may go out to a vulnerable community like the immigrant community to make money and engage in this fraud and they should not be practicing law at all. And those can elevate to a felony depending on the circumstances of the case. So when we talk about practicing a law without a license, it's not just your immigration consultant. It could actually be somebody who is a lawyer who went to law school, but for whatever reason is not allowed at that time to be practicing law uh, by the state bar rules for whatever reason. Um, and there's a variety of reasons, but for whatever reason. So these are the types of things that we would encourage people to come forward and let us know because we cannot have lawyers out there um, engaging this type of behavior. Steve? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. My office has an entire team of uh, attorneys and investigators uh, devoted to non-attorney unauthorized practice of law. So that deals with your uh, immigration consultants who are, end up practicing law or, or holding themselves out as capable of practicing law. That may involve uh, sending out letters on, on letterhead that says uh, immigration law company you know, something like that, uh, or something that makes it appear that they have a law firm. And so we can uh, prosecute them for either holding themselves out uh, to be an, an attorney or uh, actually practicing law. Both of those are violations. As Paul mentioned, there's a whole other category of people who may have actually gone to law school, become an attorney uh, in this state or somewhere else, and uh, they are may not be authorized to practice law because they haven't uh, paid their licensing fees, uh, have not gotten the continuing education they're required to get. Uh, those would be a sort of administrative type of suspensions, or they may have prior discipline and been suspended for disciplinary reasons, and they're there for not entitled to practice law. And we can also prosecute them. If they are suspended, uh, then we can uh, file an action in state bar court and prosecute them for that unauthorized practice of law. If they have been disbarred, then we uh, get back into that situation where we sort of don't have any real jurisdiction over them anymore because we can't take their license away again. Uh, so then it sort of is back to local law enforcement, inc including district attorney's offices and city attorney's offices uh, to prosecute them. But again, we would uh, conduct that investigation and, and partner with local law enforcement to ensure that they are uh, prosecuted to the gr greatest extent as is appropriate. Yeah. And I would just want to keep reiterating, Steve, because, you know, as we talk about these things and unauthorized practice of law and people using letterhead, you know, 
if people aren't coming forward, there are so many people in the state of California and there's so many consultants, there's so many lawyers that, that if people are not coming forward and advising us, it's very, very hard to work from your level at the state bar backwards or from the county level and work backwards. We really need people to at least make us aware. <clears throat> and if, even if it is just an anonymous phone call or email to my office about something, it at least can start the ball rolling so that we're looking at an individual where we can get that false advertising or uh, the consultant holding himself out to have an Esquire after his name or her name when they don't. Uh, but it really takes uh, people to come forward to advise us because I got to believe, even though you have a team of people uh, going up and down the state of California, trying to identify all the individuals who are taking advantage of our vulnerable communities is almost an impossibility. I agree. We, I mean, we have uh, some resources to devote to that, but I not only strongly suspect, but I uh, believe that that the victimization is vastly underreported and we find out about only a fraction of the incidents where it actually occurs, which is why I'm here uh, trying to get the word out uh, like you are, uh, uh, trying to convey to people that they shouldn't be concerned about coming forward, that there's that we don't consider their immigration status uh, and they should, uh, number one, know how to come forward and file a complaint and not be fearful uh, about doing so. And so the more we can get the word out, uh, the more we can come to organizations like this and, and explain what's going on and how we, the tools that we have to combat these issues, uh, the better off we'll be. You know, Steve, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. I was playing around with the chat. And it looks like we got a good question that's pretty topical for what we're talking about right now from uh, Dan Clayton. And it says, it sounds like the problem is widespread enough that it might make sense to have a centralized registration process of all attorneys and consultants that are authorized to practice immigration law or immigration consulting in California. Can this be established? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but they are supposed to register with the state if they are an immigration consultant, correct? I, I believe that to be true. But what do you think about that? Is there, is there a way the state bar can have a central receptacle of these individuals? Is that something we could accomplish? I don't know whether the state bar would be the appropriate agency for that. I believe that there is another uh, regulation uh, regulating agency for immigration consultants where I assume that they are all registered. Um, for us, that, that would be sort of the unauthorized practice of law. It would, it would be, and because we have jurisdiction over attorneys, uh, I don't know that we'd be the appropriate agency to collect that registration information, but I, I would assume that we are, uh, interacting with that regulatory agency, whether it be the, uh, you know, consumer affairs or whatever, uh, in order to investigate and prosecute those cases where appropriate. Yeah. And I, I believe the consultants are required to register with um, the state. I think it might be, well, they have to register with secretary of state, but I, they, I mean, they do have to register and be bonded. But I guess the real issue is it's the public knowing that it exists and that they can go look to see if this individual is actually legitimate or not. And too often, a lot of these consultants or attorneys spread by word of mouth. So it is a good idea. Um, and maybe that is something we can work with uh, the chamber here in Contra Costa County to get out more information about where you can go to make sure that somebody is a licensed consultant or a legitimate immigration consultant. Absolutely. I think that that's a, a great idea. Uh, of course, the concern or the primary concern of the state bar is that they are going beyond what they are entitled to do, that, uh, right. that they're doing more than just filling out the, the paperwork, that they are actually entering into the unauthorized practice of law area in the sense of they may be doing something that they're not trained to do. So, Essentially, to, to sort of sum it up, the state bar regulates the practice of law in California. We, we cannot represent clients, uh, and, we, uh, uh, and for obvious reasons, we, we don't refer them to a particular attorney. But we do have resources to find people attorneys. We can connect you with a certified lawyer referral service if there's somebody that you need to help you in a with a legal issue, whether it be immigration or otherwise. You can call the State Bar Office of California uh, at 
538-2250 or email our Office of Loyal Referral Services at lrs at calbar.ca.gov. And I would encourage anyone who needs legal help to make sure that they are uh, hiring a qualified ethical attorney uh, who can help them with their issue. All right, Steve, do, are we going to open up for questioning now? I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any other chat questions. Sure, I can, uh, let's see. I don't, Mr. Clayton, I don't see ha having a microphone, but I. It was typed in on the chat. And yeah, so I don't know if I can unmute him, but I've uh, unmuted everybody else in the chat. Okay, and, and I will point out on that last question we're talking about, uh, it, Consultants are required to post a bond to do consultant work. But I still think the problem is anytime we have a list or, you know, authorized attorneys, it still is those attorneys or consultants still could act outside, like you said, outside the scope of their abilities. And it's really hard to know that they're doing that, even though they're on a list, unless and until somebody comes forward and lets us know. Which is exactly why we need people to be willing to come forward so that we can help them. Yes. And we have people unmuted. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, this I is guess Dan. this means it was pretty clear. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation. I appreciate that. Good. There's a good slide on the, uh, I guess it was on the, the resources available to the State Bar of California that uh, showed some of the uh, websites and uh, contacts for information. Could you uh, think of the few slides back? Could you show that again? I can certainly try. Uh, let me no, know. you can do it, Steve. <laughs> this presentation is, this is being one? recorded and will be shared on social media and will also be uh, mailed out to the Hispanic Chamber constituency. So hopefully everyone uh, here will be able to access it soon after the meeting. Is this the slide that you were speaking of? Perfect. Yes, that's, that's the one. I think that's... Um, very helpful as folks might have questions on this. Fantastic. And, and I think from my experience or just there still is a stigma attached as being a prosecutor locally that um, I, I think a lot of people, especially um, our, our immigrant communities are afraid to come forward to maybe a police department or to a prosecutor's office. But, you know, the state bar in, in sending a complaint form or uh, notifying the state bar can actually start the ball rolling. And I think um, a lot of people are more comfortable maybe going forward to a state bar organization, then they may be coming, walking down to our office. Um, but they're certainly welcome at our office. And our information is very, very simple. You can just type in Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office and our phone number and email addresses are there and people can send us information, like I said, even anonymously and get the ball rolling. Fantastic. Have, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and give everybody here uh, about a good uh, 20 minutes back here. So I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Moat and uh, Mr. Paul Graves for leaving their heart out on the playing field. This was a very informative webinar, and we uh, really appreciate all the information that we've been able to capture here today. This webinar has been captured here in a screen share recording, so we will be making it available online uh, on the website, and uh, we'll, we'll be posting it on social media on the Hispanic Chamber Facebook page for both the Contra Costa and the Alameda County Hispanic Chambers, and we'll also be pushing it out to our list of 15,000-plus uh, constituents. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Mr. Moad and Mr. Graves, uh, any parting uh, comments? Uh, well, I would just like to thank the Hispanic Chamber for bringing this topic out and for letting us get it out to as many people as possible and for taking a proactive approach here so that we can hopefully reach out to people and let them know that they're welcome to come forward to our office and to the State Bar. And I'm sure, Steve, you probably have some parting comments as well. No, I, I echo those comments. My interest is, is in spreading this information as widely as possible uh, to any and every community. Uh, th these are common problems uh, throughout California, and we need to get the word out uh, 
so that people know that they can come forward, they know how to come forward, and they know when to come forward, and they know how to avoid fraud or becoming a victim in the first place.